A chapter one, journey to her chest. The divine root conceives and the spring breaks forth. As the heart's nature is cultivated, the great way arises. Before chaos was divided, heaven and earth were one. All was a shapeless blur and no men had appeared. Once Pan Gu destroyed the enormous vagueness, the separation of clear and impure began. Living things have always tended towards humanity. From their creation, all beings improve. If you want to know about creation in time, read Difficulties Resolved on the Journey to the West. In the arithmetic of the universe, 129,600 years make one cycle. Each cycle can be divided into 12 phases. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. The 12 branches. Each phase lasts 10,800 years. Now, within a single day, the positive begins at the time 1. And at 2, the cock crows at three it is not quite light at four the sun rises five is after breakfast and at six one does business seven is when the sun reaches noon at eight it is slipping towards the west nine is late afternoon the sun sets at 10 11 is dusk and at 12 people settle down for the night if you compare this with big numbers, then at the end of phase 11, heaven and earth were still one, and no beings had appeared. 5,400 years later came in the beginning of phase 12, when all was darkness and there were still no people or other creatures. For this reason, it was called chaos. Another 5,400 years later, phase 12 was drawing to a close and a new cycle was about to begin. As phase one of the new era approached, gradually there was light. As Xiao Yang said, when winter reaches the midpoint of phase one, the heart of heaven does not move. Where the positive first appears, nothing has yet come to life. At this time, heaven first had a foundation. 5,400 years later, in the middle of phase one, the light and pure rose upwards and and sun, moon, stars, and constellations were created. These were called the four images, hence the saying that heaven began in one. Another 5,400 years later, when phase one was nearing its end and phase two was imminent, things gradually solidified. As the book of changes says, great is the positive, far reaching is the negative. All things are endowed and born in accordance with heaven. This was when the earth began to congeal. After 5,400 more years came the height of phase two, when the, heaven, when the heavily and impure solidified and water, fire, mountain, stone, and earth came into being. These five were called the five movers. Therefore, it is said that the earth was created in phase two. After a further 5,400 years, at the end of phase two and the beginning of phase three, Living beings were created, in the words of the book of the calendar. The essence of the sky came down and the essence of the earth went up. Heaven and earth intermingled and all creatures were born. Then heaven was bright and earth was fresh, and the positives, positive intermingled with the negative. 5,400 years later, when phase, two, or phase three was at its height, men, birds, and beasts were created. Thus the three powers, heaven, earth, and man, now had their set places. Therefore, it is said that man was created in phase three. Moved by Pangu's, Pangu's creation, the three emperors put the word world in order and the five rulers laid down the moral code. The world was then divided into four great continents. The eastern continent, continent of a superior body, the western continent, continent of cattle gift the southern continent of jambu and the northern continent of kuru this book deals with only the eastern continent of superior body beyond the seas there is a country called aoli this country is next to an ocean and in the middle of the ocean is a famous island called the mountain of flowers and fruit 
This mountain is the ancestral artery of the ten continents, the origin of the three islands. It was formed when the clear and impure were separated and the enormous vagueness was divided. It is a really splendid mountain, and there are some verses to prove it. It stills the ocean with its might, it awes the jade sea into calm. It stills the ocean with its might, tides wash its silver slopes, and fish swim into its caves. It awes the jade sea into calm. Amid the snowy breakers, the sea serpent rises from the deep. It rises high in the corner of the world where fire and wood meet. Its summit towers above the eastern sea, red cliffs and strange rocks, beetling crags and jagged peaks. On the red cliff, phoenixes sing in pairs. Lone unicorns lie before the beetling crags. The cry of pheasants is heard upon the peaks. It caves the dragons come and go. <clears throat> there are deer of long life and magic foxes in the woods. Miraculous birds and black cranes in the trees. There are flowers of jade and strange plants that wither not. Green pine and bluish cypress ever in leaf. Magic peaches always in fruit. Clouds gather around the tall bamboo. The wisteria grows thick around the mountain brook, and the banks around are newly colored with flowers. It is the heaven-supporting pillar where all the rivers meet, the earth's root unchanged through a myriad e e eons. There was once a magic stone on the top of this mountain, which was 36 feet 5 inches high and 24 feet round. It was 36 feet five inches high to correspond with the 365 degrees of the heavens and 24 feet round to match the 24 divisions of the solar calendar. On top of it were the nine apertures and eight holes for the nine palaces and the eight trigrams. There were no trees around it to give shade, but magic fungus and orchids clung to its sides. Ever since creation began, it had been receiving the truth of heaven the beauty of earth, the essence of the sun, and the splendor of the moon. And it had been influenced by them for so long, it had miraculous powers. It developed a magic womb, which burst open one day to produce a stone egg about the size of a ball. When the wind blew on this egg, it turned into a stone monkey complete with five senses and four limbs. When the stone monkey had learned to crawl and walk, he bowed to each of the four quarters, and his eyes moved. Two beams of golden light shot towards the pole star palace that startled the supreme heavenly sage, the great compassionate jade emperor of the azure vault of heaven, who was sitting surrounded by his immortal ministers on his throne in the hall of miraculous mist in the golden gated cloud palace. When he saw the dazzling golden light, he ordered thousand mile eye and wind accompanying ear to open the Southern gate of heaven and take a look. The two officers went out through the gate in obedience to the Imperial command. And while one observed what was going on, the other listened carefully. Soon afterwards, they responded back. In obedience to the Imperial mandate, your subjects observed and listened to the source of the golden light. We found that the edge of the country of Aeoli, which is east of the ocean belonging to the eastern continent of superior body. There is an island called the Mountain of Flowers and Fruit. A magic stone on the top of this mountain produced a magic egg, and when the wind blew on this egg, it turned into a stone monkey, which bowed to each of the four quarters. When he moved his eyes, golden light shot towards the Pole Star Palace. But now that he is eating and drinking, the golden light is gradually dying. In his benevolence and mercy, the Jade Emperor said, Creatures down below are born of the essence of heaven and earth. There is nothing remarkable about him. On his mountain, the monkey was soon able to run and jump, feed from plants and trees, drink from brooks and springs, pick mountain flowers and look for fruit. He made friends with the wolves and went around with the tigers and leopards, was on good terms with the deer and had the other monkeys and apes for relations. After, oops, at night he slept under the rock faces and he roamed around the peaks and caves by day. As the saying so rightly goes, there is no calendar in the mountains and when winter's over, you don't know the time of year. 
On hot mornings, he and all the other monkeys would play under the shade of some pines to avoid the heat. Just look at them all. Climbing trees, picking flowers, looking for fruit, throwing pellets, playing knuckle bones, running around, running around sandy hollows, building stone pe pagodas, chasing dragonflies and catching, catching locusts, worshiping the sky and visiting Bonahista, Bonahista Vas, tearing off creepers and wearing straw hats. Catching fleas, then popping them with their teeth and fingers, grooming their coats and sharpening their nails, beating, scratching, pushing, squashing, tearing, and tugging, playing all over the place until the pine, under the pine trees, washing them si themselves beside the green stream. After playing, the monkeys would go and bathe in the stream, a mountain torrent that tumbled along the rolling melons. There's an undi an old saying. Birds have bird language and animals have animal talk. All the monkeys said to each other, I wonder where that water comes from. We've got nothing else to do today, so wouldn't it be fun to go upstream and find its source? With a shout, they all ran off, leading their children and calling to their brothers. They climbed up the mountain beside the stream until they reached its source, where a waterfall cascaded from a spring they saw. One white rainbow arcing. A thousand strands of flying snow, unbroken by the sea winds, still they're under the moon. Cold air divides the greeny crags, splashes moisten the mountainside, a noble waterfall cascades, hanging suspended like a curtain. The monkeys clapped their hands and explained with delight, what lovely water, it must go all the way to the bottom of the mountain and join the waves of the sea. Then one monkey made a suggestion. If anyone is clever enough to go through the fall, find the source and come out in one piece, let's make him our king. When this challenge had been shouted three times, the stone monkey leapt out from the crowd and answered at the top of his voice, I'll go, I'll go, splendid monkey indeed. Today he will make his name, tomorrow his destiny shall triumph. He is fated to live here, as king he will enter the immortal's palace. Watch him as he shuts his eyes, crouches, and springs, leaping straight into the waterfall. When he opened his eyes and raised his head to look around, he saw ne neither water nor waves. A bridge stood in front of him, as large as life. He stopped, calmed himself, took a closer look, and saw that the bridge was made of iron. The water had rushed under it, poured out through a fissure in the rocks. Screening the gateway to the bridge, he startled, started walking towards the bridge. And as he looked, he made out what seemed to be a house. It was a really good place, he saw. Emerald moss piled up in heaps of blue, white clouds like drifting jade, while the light flickered among wisps of colored mist. A quiet house was peaceful windows, with peaceful windows. Flowers growing on the smooth bench, dragon pearls hanging in niches, exotic blooms all around. Traces of fire beside the stove. Scraps of food in the vessels by the table. Adorable stone chairs and beds. Even better stone plates and bowls. One or two tall ba bamboos. Three or four sprigs of plum blossom. A few pines that always attracted rain. All just like a real home. He took a good long look and then scampered to the middle of the bridge. From where he noticed a stone tablet. On the tablet had been carved in big square letters, happy land of the mountain of flowers and fruit, cave, he cave heaven of the water curtain. The stone monkey was beside himself with glee. He rushed away, shut his eyes, crouched, and leapt back through the waterfall. We're in luck, we're in luck, he said with a chuckle. All the other monkeys crowded around him asking, what's it like in there? How deep is the water? There's no water, none at all, replied the stone monkey. There's an iron bridge, and on the other side of the bridge, there's a house that must have been made by heaven and an earth. Heaven and earth. How ever could you see a house there? The other monkeys asked. The stone monkey chuckled again. The water here comes from under the bridge and through the rocks, and it hides the gateway to the bridge from, the vi from view. There are flowers and trees by the bridge, and a stone house too. 
Inside the house are stone rooms, a stone stove, stone bowls, stone plates, stone beds, and even stone benches. In the middle of it all is a tablet which says, Happy Land of the Mountain of Flowers and Fruit, Cave, ha cave Heaven of the Water Curtain. It's just the place for us to settle down in. There's room there for thousands. Let's all move in. Then we won't have to put up with any more nonsense from heaven in there. <clears throat> we can hide there from the wind and shelter from the rain. With nothing to fear from frost and snow and never a rumble of thunder. The clouded mist glow bright and the place smells lucky the pine and bamboo will always be beautiful and rare flowers blossom every day the other monkeys were also delighted to hear this that they said you go first and take us with you the stone monkey shut his eyes crouched and leapt again shouting follow me in follow me in the braver monkeys all jumped through the more timid ones peered forward shrank back rubbed their ears, scratched their cheeks, shouted, and yelled at the top of their voices before going in, all clinging to each other. <coughs> After rushing across the bridge, they all grabbed plates and snatched bowls, begged stoves and fought over beds, and moved everything around. Monkeys are born naughty, and they could not keep quiet for a single moment until they had worn themselves out moving things around. The stone monkey sat himself in the main seat and said, Gentlemen, a man who breaks his word is worthless. Just now you said that if anyone was clever enough to come in here and get out again in one piece, you'd make him king. Well, well then, I've come in and gone out, and gone out and come in. I found you gentlemen a cave he heaven where you can sleep in peace and all settle down to live in bliss. Why haven't you made me king? <clears throat> on hearing this all the monkeys bowed and prostrated themselves not daring to disobey they lined up in groups in order of age and paid their homage as at court all acclaiming him as the great king of a thousand years the stone monkey then took the throne made the word stone taboo and called himself handsome monkey king there's a poem to prove it that goes I got a tickle in my throat now <clears throat> He's a monkey. All things are born from the three positives. The magic stone was quick with the essence of sun and moon. An egg has turned into a monkey to complete the great way. He was lent a name so that the elixir would be complete. Looking inside, he perceives nothing because it was no form. It has no form. Outside, he uses his intelligence to create visible things. Men have always been like this. Those who are called kings and sages do just as they wish. <clears throat> Taking control of his host of monkeys, apes, gibbons, and others, the handsome monkey king divided them into rulers and subjects, assistants, and officers. In the morning, they roamed the mountain of flowers and fruit, and in the evening, they settled down for the night in the water curtain cave. They made a compact that they would not join the ranks of the birds or go with the running beasts. They had their own king, and they thoroughly enjoyed themselves. In spring, they picked flowers for food and drink. In summer, they lived off fruit. In autumn, they gathered tares and chestnuts. They got through the winter on Solomon's seal. The handsome monkey king's innocent high spirits could not, of course, last three or four hundred years. One day, he suddenly felt depressed during a banquet with his monkey host, and he started to weep. The startled monkeys crowd round, bowed to him, and asked, What's the matter, your majesty? Although I'm happy now, the monkey king replied, I'm worried about the future. That's what's getting me down. The other monkeys laughed and said, Your majesty is being greedy. We have parties every day. We live in a mountain paradise, in an ancient cave in a divine continent. We are spared the rule of unicorns, the dom domination of phoenixes, and the re restraints of human kings. We are free to do just as we like. We are inf 
infinitely lucky. Why make yourself miserable worrying about the future? To this, the Monkey King replied, Yes, we don't have to submit to the laws and regulations of human kings, and we don't live in terror of the power of birds and beasts. But the time will come when we are old and weak, and the underworld is controlled by the king of hell. When the time comes for us to die, we won't be able to go on living among the blessed, and our lives will have been in vain. All the monkeys covered their faces and wept as everyone as every one of them thought about death. Suddenly, a gibbon jumped out from their ranks and shrieked in a piercing voice. If your majesty is thinking so far ahead, this is the beginning of enlightenment. Now, of the five creatures, there are only three that do not come under the jurisdiction of the king of hell. Do you know which they are? asked the monkey king. Yes, the ape replied. There are Buddhas, the immortals, and the sages. They are free from the wheel of reincarnation. They are not born and they do not die. They are as eternal as heaven and earth, as the mountains and the rivers. Where do they live? The monkey king asked. Only in the human world, the ape replied. In ancient caves on magic mountains, the monkey king was delighted to hear this. I shall leave you all tomorrow, he said, and go down the mountain if I have to. I'll roam the corners of the oceans and go to the edge of the sky to find these three kinds of beings and discover the secret of eternal youth that will keep us out of the clutches of the king of hell forever. Goodness, because of these words, he was to learn how to free, how to be free from the wheel of reincarnation and become the great sage equaling heaven. All the monkeys clapped with approval and said, Great, great, tomorrow we'll climb all over the mountain and get lots of fruit to give your majesty a really big banquet to send you off. The next day, the monkeys set out to pick magic peaches, gather rare fruits, dig out yams, and cut Solomon's seal. Magic fungus and fragrant orchid were collected. Everything was set on the stone benches and the stone tables with fairy wine and dishes. You could see. <clears throat> golden pills and per pearl pellets bursting red and plump yellow the golden pills and pearl pellets were winter cherries beautiful and sweet the bursting red and plump yellow were ripe plums tasty and sharp fresh sweet fleshed legons with thin skins fiery leeches with tiny stones in red sack branch after branch of crab apples, yellow-skinned loquats with their leaves on, rabbit head pear pears and chicken heart jujubes. To quench your thirst, remove your cares and sober you up. Fragrant peaches and tender apricots, as sweet and luscious as jade wine. Crisp plums and arbutus, as sharp as glistening yogurt. Bright melons with red coats and black seeds. Big four-sectioned persimmons with yellow skins. Bursting pomegranates. Cinnabar pipes shining like fire crystal pearls. Opened water chestnuts with firm round flesh like golden agate. Walnuts and ginkgo fruits to eat with tea. Coconuts and grapes to make into wine. Dishes loaded with pine cones, you, you nuts, filberts, and crab apples. Tangerines, sugarcane, and oranges covered the table. Hot roast yams, tender boiled Solomon seal, pounded china root, and jobs tears simmered in soup in a stone pot. Although we humans have rare delicacies, to eat. We are no happier than those monkeys in the mountains. The host of monkeys ushered the handsome monkey king to the seat of honor and sat down below him according to age. Each of them took in turn to bring him wine, flowers, and fruit, and they drank hard for a whole day. The next morning, the handsome monkey king got up early and ordered, children, tear down some old pines and make me a raft. Find a bamboo pole to punt with and load it up with fruit. 
I'm going. He went aboard the raft all by himself, pushed off with all his might, and floated off towards the waves of the ocean. He intended to sail with the wind and cross over the southern Jambu continent. The heaven-born monkey, whose conduct was so noble, left his island to drift with heaven's winds. He sailed oceans and seas to find the way of immortality, deeply determined to do a great deed. The predestined one should not have vulgar longings. He can attain the primal truth without care or worry. He is bound to find a kindred spirit to explain the origins and the laws of nature. Bless you. This is better than lo-fi. <laughs> You're welcome. He had chosen just the right time for his journey. After he boarded his raft, the southeasterly wind blew hard for days on end and bore him to the northwestern shore of the southern continent. You have better lungs than me? <laughs> Testing the depth of the water with his pole, he made or he found that it was shallow. So he abandoned the raft and jumped ashore. He saw humans by the coast, fishing, hunting geese, gathering clams, ext and extracting salt. He went up to them, leaping around and making faces, which so scared them that they dropped their baskets and nets and fled in all directions as fast as they could. The Monkey King grabbed one of them, who was a poor runner, stripped him of his clothes, and dressed himself in them like a human. He swaggered through the provinces and prefectures, learning human behavior and human speech in the marketplaces. Whether he was eating his breakfast or doing or going to bed at night, he was always asking about Buddhas, immortals, and sages, and seeking the secret of eternal youth. He observed that the people of the world were too concerned with fame and fortune to be interested in their fates. Oops. <clears throat> when will the struggle for fame and fortune end? Toiling from morning till night, never pleasing yourself. Those who ride donkeys long for stallions. The prime minister always wants to be a prince. The only worry about having to stop work to eat or dress. They never fear that the king of hell will come to get them. When trying to ensure their sons and grandsons inherit their wealth and power, they have no time to stop and think. Although he asked about the way of the immortals, the monkey king was unable to meet one. He spent eight or nine years in the southern Jambu continent, going through its great walls and visiting its little, little counties. When he found that he had reached the great western ocean, he thought that there must be sages and immortals on the other side of it. So he made himself another raft like the last one and floated across the western ocean until he came to the western continent of Cattle Gift. He went to shore and made extensive and lengthy inquiries until one day he came upon a high and beautiful mountain, thickly forested on its lower slopes, not fearing wolves and undaunted by tigers or leopards. He climbed to the summit to see the view. It was indeed a fine mountain. <clears throat> a thousand peaks brandishing halberds, screens 10,000 measures tall. In the sunlight, the mountain haze, it lightly touched with blue. After the rain, the black rocks look coldly green. Withered creepers coil around ancient trees, and the old ford marks the bounds of the mysterious. Strange flowers and precious plants, flourishing in all four seasons, rivaling fairyland. The nearby cry of a hidden bird, the clear running of a spring. Valley upon valley of mushroom and orchid, Lichen grows all over the cliffs. The range rises and dips in dragon-like majesty. Surely there must be lofty hermits here. As he was looking at the view of the monkey king, wait, as he was looking at the view, the monkey king heard a human voice coming from the depths of the forest. He rushed into the trees, and when he co cocked his ear to listen, he heard a song. <coughs> all right. Watching the chess game, I cut through the rotten, felling trees ding-ding, strolling at the edge of the cloud and the mouth of the valley. 
I sell firewood to buy wine, cackling with laughter and perfectly happy. I pillow myself on a pine root, looking up at the moon. When I wake up, it is light. Recognizing the old forest, I scale cliffs and cross ridges, cutting down withered creepers with my axe. When I've gathered a basketful, I walk down to the market with a song and trade it for three pints of rice. Nobody else competes with me, so prices are stable. I don't speculate or try sharp practice. Couldn't care less what people think of me. Calmly lengthening my days, the people I meet are Taos and Immortals, sitting quietly and expounding the yellow court. The Monkey King was overjoyed to hear this, and he said with glee, So this is where the Immortals have been hiding. He bounded deeper into the woods for a closer look and saw that the singer was a woodcutter cutting firewood. He was wearing the most unusual clothes. On his head, he wore a hat woven from the first skin shed by new bamboo shoots. The clothes on his body were made of yam from the wild cotton tree. The belt around his waist was of silk from an old silk worm. The straw sandals under his feet had straps torn from rotten sago trees. In his hand, he held a steel ax. On his back, he carried a hempen rope. At climbing pines and felling dead trees, who was a match for this woodcutter? The Monkey King went closer and called to him, Old Immortal, your disciple greets you. The woodcutter dropped his axe in astonishment and turned around to say, No, no, I don't even have enough to eat or drink, so how can I possibly let you call me an immortal? If you're not an immortal, the Monkey King said, why do you talk like one? I don't talk like an immortal, the woodcutter said. At the edge of the wood just now, the Monkey King replied, I heard you say, the people I meet are Taos and Immortals, sitting quietly and expounding the Man Ting Fang. The Man Ting Fang contains the truth about the way. So if you're not an immortal, what are you? The woodcutter laughed. It's quite true that the song is called The Fragrance of the Man Ting Fang. An immortal who lives near my hut taught me it. He said, said he saw how hard I had to work and how I was always worried, so he made me sing the song when things were getting me down. It lightens my cares and makes me forget my weariness. I was singing it just now because I had some problems on my mind, and I never imagined that you would be listening. <clears throat> if you've got an immortal for a neighbor, you ought to learn from him how to cultivate your conduct and get him to teach you a recipe for eternal youth. I've had a hard life, the woodcutter replied. My mother and father brought me up till I was about eight, and just when I was beginning to know about life, my father died. My mother remained a widow, and I had no brothers or sisters, as I was the only child I had to look after my mother morning and night. Now she is old th that I can't Now she is old that I can't possibly leave her. Our land is so overgrown that I can't grow enough to feed and clothe both of us, so I have to cut a couple of bundles of firewood to sell in the market for a handful of coppers to buy the few pints of rice that I cooked for myself and for my mother. That's why I can't cultivate my conduct. From what you say, the Monkey King replied, you're a uh, filial son of a gentleman. You're bound to the rewarded for it one day. You're bound to be rewarded for it one day, but I'd be grateful if you could show me where the immortal lives so that I can go and pay him my respects. The woodcutter said, it's not far from here. The mountain is the Spirit Tower Heart Mountain, and in it there is the cave of the setting moon and the three stars. In that cave lives an immortal called Patriarch Subhuti. I don't know how many disciples he has trained. There are 30 or 40 of them cultivating their conduct with him at the moment. If you take that path south or two or three miles, you'll reach his home. The Monkey King tugged at the woodcutter and said, Take me there, elder brother. If I get anything out of this, I won't forget your kindness. You idiot, the woodcutter replied. Didn't you understand what I just, what I t told you just now? If I went with you, I wouldn't be able to earn my living, and who would look after my poor old mother then? I've got to get on with my woodcutting. Go by yourself. 
After hearing this, the Monkey King had to take his leave. He came out of the forest and found the path, which led up a mountain slope for two or three miles. When he saw the cave, he pulled himself up to his full height to take a look, and it was a really magnificent place. Misty clouds scattered colors, sun and moon shimmered bright, a thousand ancient cypresses, ten thousand lofty bamboos, a thousand ancient cypresses, cypresses, <laughs> a soft green drawing the rain from the sky, ten thousand lofty bamboos, and a misty valley is azure blue. Outside the gate, rare flowers spread brocade, beside the bridge, wafts the scent of jade flowers rocky crags jut glossy with green moss in overhanging cliffs blue lichen grows sometimes the call of the crane is heard and often you see the phoenix soar the cave of the crane echoes beyond the ninth heaven and the milky way when the phoenix soars the brilliance of its wings colors the clouds black apes and white deer can be just made out Golden lions and jade elephants prefer to keep hidden. If you look closely at this happy land, you will see that it rivals paradise. He saw that the doors of the cave were shut fast and that everything was still. With no signs of any people, he turned round and noticed that there was a stone tablet about 30 feet high and 8 feet wide at the top of the cliff. On it was carved in enormous letters, Spirit Tower Heart Martin. Heart Mountain, Cave of the Setting Moon and the Three Stars. The Monkey King exclaimed with delight, The people here really are honest. The mountain and the cave do exist. He took a good long look, but did not dare to knock on the door. He climbed to the end of a pine branch and ate some pine seeds to amuse himself. Before long, the doors of the cave opened with a creak, and an immortal boy came out. In the nobility of his bearing and the ex exceptional purity of his features he was completely different from an ordinary boy his hair was bound with a pair of silken bands his flowing gown had two capacious sleeves his face and body were naturally distinguished his mind and appearance were both empty for many years a guest beyond the world of things an eternal child amid the mountains untouched by speck by any speck of dust, he let the years go tumbling by. When this boy had come out, he shouted, Who's making that row out there? Out here. The monkey king scampered down the tree, went up to him, and said with a bow, Immortal child, I'm a disciple who has come to ask about the way and study under the immortal. The last thing I'd do would be to make a row here, the boy laughed. So you've come to ask about the way, have you? Yes, the monkey king replied. Our master has just got up, the boy said, and has now mounted the dais to ex expound the way. Before he had started to explain about origins, he told me to open the door. He said, there is someone outside who wants to cultivate his conduct. Go and welcome him. I suppose he must have meant you. Yes, he meant me, the monkey king said with a smile. Come with me, the boy said. The Monkey King straightened his clothes and followed the boy deep into the depths of the cave. He saw majestic pavilions and towers of red jade, pearl palaces and gateways of cowrie, and countless rooms of silence and secluded cells, leading all the way to a jasper dais. He saw the pa patriarch Subhuddy sitting on the dais and 36 minor immortals standing below it. A golden immortal of great enlightenment, free from filth. Subhuddy, the marvel of the Western world, neither dying nor born, he practices the triple meditation, his spirit and soul entirely benevolent. In empty detachment, he follows the changes. Having found his true nature, he, set, he lets it run free. As eternal as heaven and majestic in body, the great teacher of the law is enlightened through it. Aeon. Eons. Aeons? <clears throat> as soon as the handsome monkey king saw him, he bowed low and knocked his head on the ground before him many times, saying, 
Master, master, your disciple pays his deepest respects. White Truth Wukon. Adventure of the to the East. Where are you from? The pet patriarch asked. You must tell me your name and address before you can become my pupil. I come from the water curtain cave in the flowers of Fruit Mountain, in the land of Aeoli, in the eastern continent of Superior Body, replied the Monkey King. Throw him out, the patriarch roared. He's a liar and a cheat, and even if he tried cultivating his conduct, he wouldn't get nowhere. The Monkey King desperately kept hitting his head on the ground and said, You just spiped. Your disciple spoke the truth. I promise I wasn't lying. The patriarch asked, If you were speaking the truth, why did you say that you came from the eastern continent of Superior Body? Between here and the eastern continent, there are two seas in the southern Jambu continent. So how could you possibly have come here from there? The Monkey King, still kowtowing, replied, I sailed across the seas and oceans, crossed frontiers and wandered through many countries for over 10 years before I arrived here. So you came here by stages, the patriarch remarked. What is your surname? I'm not surly, the monkey king replied. If people call me names, it doesn't bother me. And if they hit me, I don't get angry. I'm just polite to them and that's that. I've never been surly. I didn't ask if you were surly. I wanted to know the surname you inherited from your parents. I didn't have any parents, the Monkey King replied. If you had no parents, did you grow on a tree? I grew not on a tree, but in a stone, the Monkey King replied. All I remember is that there was a magic stone on the top of, flo of the flower and fruit mountain, and that one year the stone split open and I was born. Concealing his delight and this, the patriarch remarked, in other words, you were born of heaven and earth. Walk around for a moment and let me have a good look at you. The Monkey King leapt to his feet and shambled around a couple of times. The Patriarch smiled and said, Though you have rather a base sort of body, you look like one of the... Rissus? 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 Monkeys that eat pine seeds and I ought to give you a surname that fits your appearance and call you who macaque <laughs> I think it's in brackets so who I think it just means a uh, macaque monkey the elements that make up the character of who are animal old and moon what is old is ancient and the moon embodies the negative principle and that is ancient and negative cannot be transformed but i think i would do much better to call you sun which means monkey apart from the animal element the character sun has one part implying male and one part suggesting a baby which fits in with my basic theories about children your surname will be sun when the monkey king heard this he Kowtowed with delight and said, Great, great, now I have a surname. I am eternally grateful to you for your mercy and compassion, Master. I beg you to give me a personal name to go with my new surname. Then it will be much easier to address me. There are twelve words within my sect, said the patriarch, when I give which I give as names. You belong to the tenth generation of my disciples. Goku. <laughs> That's the Japanese translation. What are these 12 words? Asked the Monkey King. Broad, great, wisdom, intelligence, true, likeness, nature, sea, bright, awakened, complete, and enlightenment. If we work at the generations of disciples, then you should have the name with Wu, awakened in it. So we can give you the Dharma, Dharma's name, Sun Wukong, which means monkey awakened to emptiness. Will that do? Marvelous, marvelous, said the smiling monkey king. From now on, my name will be Sun Wukong. Indeed. When the great vagueness 
was separated, there were no surnames. To smash foolishness, emptiness, he had to be awakened to emptiness. If you want to know what success he had in cultivating his conduct, you must listen to the explanation in the next installment. Chapter 2 He becomes aware of the wonderful truth of enlightenment. By killing the demon, he realizes his spirit nature. The story goes on to tell how after being given a name, the handsome monkey king jumped for joy and bowed to Subhudi to express his thanks. The patriarch then ordered the others to make Sun Wukong out through the double doors and teach him how to sprinkle and sweep the floor, answer orders, and to port himself properly. All the immortals went out in obedience to this command. When Sun Wukong was outside the doors, he bowed to all his spiritual elder brothers and laid out his bed on the veranda. Veranda? Is that how you spell veranda? The next morning and every following day, he studied language and deportment under his spiritual elder brothers, expounded the scriptures, discussed the way, practiced calligraphy, and burnt incense. When he had any spare time, he would sweep the grounds, dig the vegetable patch, grow flowers, tend trees, look for kindling, light the fire, carry water, and fetch soy. Everything he needed was provided. Thus, six or seven years slipped by in the cave without his noticing them. One day, the patriarch took his seat on the dais, called all the immortals together, and began to explain the great way. Heavenly flowers fell in profusion, while golden lotuses burst forth from the earth. Brilliantly, he expounded the doctrine of the three vehicles, setting forth 10,000 dharmas in all, the de all their details. As he slowly waved his whisk, jewels fell from the, his mouth. Great way? <laughs> They're getting gains. <laughs> gains for immortality. Echoing like thunder and shaking the nine heavens, now preaching the way, now teaching meditation, he showed that the three beliefs are basically the same. In explaining a single word, he brought one back to the truth and taught the secrets of avoiding birth and understanding one's nature. As Monkey sat at the side listening to the exposition, he was so delighted that he tugged at his ear. I like what you got. Hey, Good Nathaniel. job. Thanks for the like. Scratched his cheek and smiled. He could not help waving his hands and stamping. When the patriarch noticed this, he said to Monkey, Why are you leaping around like a madman in class instead of listening to the lesson? Your disciple is listening to the exposition with all his attention, Monkey replied. But your marvelous words made me so happy that I started jumping around without really realizing what I was doing. Please forgive me. To this, the patriarch replied, If you really understand my marvelous words, then answer this question. How long have you been in my cave? You, disciple, was born stupid, Monkey replied. So I have no idea how long I've been here. All I know is that w whenever the fire in the stove goes out, I go to the other side of the mountain to collect firewood, and there I see a hill covered with fine peach trees. I've had seven good feeds of peaches there. That hill is called Tender Peach Hill. If you have eaten there th seven times, you must have been here seven years. What sort of way do you want to learn from me? That depends what you teach me, master. As long as there's a whiff of way to it, your disciple will learn it. There are 360 side entrances to the way, and they all lead to a true, per true result, the patriarch said. Which branch would you like to study? I will do whatever you think best, master, replied Monkey. What about teaching you the way of magic arts? What does the way of magic arts mean? Magic arts, the patriarch replied, including include summoning immortals using the magic sandboard and divining by milfoil. With them, one can learn how to bring on good fortune and avert disaster. Can you become immortal this way? 
asked Monkey. No, certainly not, replied the patriarch. No, shan't learn it. Shall I teach you the way of sex? The patriarch asked. What are the principles of the sex? Said Monkey. Within the branch of sex, there is... Confucianism? Confucianism. Confucianism, Buddhism, Taoism, the study of the negative and positive, Mohism, medicine, reading scriptures and chanting the name of, of Buddha. You can also summon immortals and sages with this branch. Can you attain immortality that way? Asked Monkey. To try and attain immortality that way, the patriarch replied, is like putting a pillar in the wall. Master, Monkey said, I'm a simple chap and I don't understand your technical jargon. What do you mean by putting a pillar in the wall? When a man builds a house and puts and wants to make it strong, he puts a pillar in the wall. But when the day comes for his mansion to collapse, the pillar is bound to rot. From what you say, Monkey observed, it's not eternal. No, shan't learn it. Shall I teach you the way of silence? The patriarch then asked. What true result can be got from silence, said Monkey. It involves abstaining from grain, preserving one's essence, silence, inaction, meditation, abstaining from speech, eating eating uh, vegetarian food, performing certain exercises when asleep or standing up, going into trances and being walled up in total isolation. Is this a way of becoming immortal? Monkey asked. It's like building the top of a kiln with sun-dried bricks, the patriarch replied. You do go on, master, said Sun Ukon. I've already told you that I can't understand your technical jargon. What does building the top of a kiln with sun-dried bricks mean? If you build the top of a kiln with sun-dried bricks, they, they may make it look all right. But if you have not been hardened with fire and water, then they will crumble away in the first heavy rainstorm. There's nothing eternal about that either, then, replied Monkey. No, shan't learn that. Shall I teach you the way of action, then? The patriarch asked. What's that like? Monkey asked. It involves acting and doing, extracting the negative and building up the positive. Drawing the bow and loading the crossbow, rubbing the navel to make the subtle humors flow, refining elixirs according to formulae, lighting fires under cauldrons, consuming red lead, purifying autumn stone and drinking woman's milk. Can doing things like this make me live forever? Monkey asked. <clears throat> To try and attain immortality that way is like lifting the moon out of water. What does lifting the moon out of water mean? The moon is in the sky, the patriarch replied, and only its reflection is in the water. Although you can see it there, you will try in vain to lift it out. No, shan't learn that, Monkey exclaimed. When the patriarch heard this, he gasped and climbed down from his dais. Pointing at Sun Wukong with his cane, he said, You won't study this and you won't study that. So what do you want, you monkey? <clears throat> he went up to Monkey and hit him three times on the head. Then went inside with his hands behind his back and shut the main door, abandoning them all. The class was shocked and they all blamed Sun Wukong. You cheeky ape, you've no idea how to behave. The master was teaching you the way, so why did you have to argue with him instead of learning from him? Now you've offended him. We don't know when he'll come out again. They were all very angry with him and regarded him with loathing and contempt. But Sun Wukong was not bothered in the least, and his face was covered with smiles. The Monkey King had understood the riddle and had the answer hidden away in his mind. So he did not argue with the others, but bore it all without a word. When the patriarch hit him three times, he had been telling him to pay attention at the third watch. And when he went inside with his hands behind his back and shut the main door, he had told the monkey king to go in through the back door and be taught the way in secret. 
The delighted Sun Wukong spent the rest of the day with the others in front of the Three Stars Cave, looking at the sky and impatient for night to come. At dusk, he went to bed like all the others, pretended to close his eyes, controlled his breathing, and calmed himself down. Nobody beats the watches or calls out the hour in the mountains, so he had no way of knowing the time except by regulating the breath going in and out of his nose. When he reckoned that it was about the third watch, he got up very quietly, dressed and slipped out through the front door away from the others. When he was outside, he looked up and saw. The moon was bright and clear and cold. The vast space of the eight points was free from dust. Deep in the trees, a bird slept hidden while the water flowed from the spring. Fireflies scattered their lights and a line of geese was stretched across the clouds. It was exactly the third watch, the right time to ask about the way. Watch the monkey king as he follows the old path to the back door, which he found to be ajar. The patriarch has left the door open, so he really intends to teach me the way, he exclaimed in delight. He tiptoed forward, went in sideways through the door, and walked over to the patriarch's bed, where he saw the patriarch sleeping, curled up, facing the inside of the room, not daring to disturb him. Sun Wukong knelt in front of the bed. Before long, the patriarch woke up, stretched out both his legs, and mumbled to himself, It's hard, hard, hard. The way is very obscure. Don't make light of the gold and the cinnabar. To teach mer miraculous spells to any but the perfect man is to tire the voice and dry the tongue in vain. Sun Wukong said in reply, Master, your disciple has been kneeling here for a long time. When the patriarch heard that it was Sun Wukong who was speaking, he pulled some clothes on, sat up cross-legged, and shouted, It's that monkey! Why have you come into my room instead of sleeping out in front? Master, you told me publicly in front of the altar yesterday that your disciple was to come in here through the back gate at the third watch as you were going to teach me the way. This is why I made so bold as to come to pay my respects beside my master's bed. The patriarch was very pleased to hear this and said to himself, This wretch was indeed born of heaven and earth, otherwise he wouldn't have been able to understand my cryptic my cryptic message. Sun Wukong said, There is no third pair of ears in this room. Your disciple is the only other person here. I hope, Master, that in your great mercy you will teach me the way of immortality. If you do, I'll always be grateful to you. You are predestined, the patriarch said. So I shall be happy to tell you, since you understood my cryptic, Message, come over here and listen carefully while I teach you the miraculous way of immortality. Sun Wukong kowtowed with gratitude and knelt before the bed, listening with all his attention. The patriarch said, True spells revealing secrets and all powerful are the only sure way of protecting one's life. They all come from essence, vapor, and spirit must be stored away securely and never be divulged. Must never be divulged and be stored in the body. Then the way I teach you will flourish of itself. Many of the benefits of learning spells, they give protection from evil desires and make one pure. Make one pure with a dazzling radiance, like a bright moon shining on a cinnabar tower. The moon contains a jade rabbit, the sun a golden crow, the tortoise and the snake are always interwined. <clears throat> uh, always interwined, then life is firm, and one can plant golden lotuses in fire. Grasp all the five elements and turn them upside down. And when you are successful, you can become a Buddha or an immortal. The patriarch's explanation went to the root of things, and Sun, Sun Wukong's heart was filled with bliss as he committed the spells to memory. He bowed to the patriarch to express his deep gratitude and went out of the back door to look. He saw that there was a trace of white in the east, while the golden light of the moon was shining in the west. He went to the front door by the old path, pushed it open gently, and went in. He sat down there. He had 
been sleeping earlier, shook his bedding and said loudly, It's dawn, it's dawn, get up. The others were all asleep. Unaware of Sun Wukong's good fortune, at daybreak he got up and muddled through the day, while secretly keeping to what he had been told. In the afternoon and evening he re regulated his breathing. After three years had passed in this way, the patriarch once more sat on his lecturing throne and expounded the Dharma to the students. <clears throat> he recounted famous sayings and parables and discussed external phenomena and ex external appearances. Without warning, he asked, Where is Sun Wukong? Sun Wukong went forward, knelt down, and replied, Your disciple is present. What way have you cultivated since coming here? Your disciple is now fairly well conservant with the Dharma, Sun Wukong replied, and my source is getting gradually stronger. If you are con conversant with the Dharma and you know about the source, the patriarch replied, and if the spirit has already flowed into you, then you must beware of the three disasters. Sun Wukong thought for a long time, then he said, Patriarch, you're talking rubbish. I have often heard that the way is lofty and is power mighty, and it is eternal as heaven, and it can overcome fire and water and prevent all illnesses from arising. So how could there be three disasters? To this, the Patriarch replied, this is not the ordinary way. It involves seizing the very creation of heaven and earth and encroaching on the hidden workings of the sun and moon. Uh. Once the elixir is made, devils and spirits cannot tolerate it. Although it will preserve the youthfulness of your face and prolong your life, in 500 years, time, heaven, will strike you with a thunderbolt. You must be clear-sighted in nature and mind so that you can hide from it before it comes. We had a music. Wow, we listened to it all. There we go. Next song. Um, <clears throat> if you succeed in avoiding it, you will live as long as heaven. And if you don't, it will kill you. Another 500 years later, heaven will burn you with fire. This fire will be not heavenly fire or ordinary fire but hidden fire it will burn you from the soles of your feet to the crown of your head your five viscera will be reduced to ashes your four limbs will be destroyed and a thousand years of asceticism will have been so much wasted time yet another 500 years later a wind will blow at you it will not be the north south east or west wind nor will it be a warm fragrant wind from the northwest or will it be the kind of wind that blows among flowers willows pine and bamboo it'll be what is called a monster wind it will blow through the crown of your head down to your six entrails you'll go through the cinnabar field below your navel and penetrate your nine orifices your flesh and your bones will be destroyed and your body will be disintegrated. You must avoid all three of these disasters. That sounds painful. <clears throat> when he heard this, Sun Wukong's hair stood on end and he katowed with the words, I implore you, my lord, to show pity and teach me how to avoid these three disasters. If you do, I will be grateful to you forever. That would be easy, the patriarch replied, but for the fact that you are different from other people, which means that I can't. I have a head that faces the sky and feet standing on earth, said Sun Wukong. I have nine orifices and four limbs, five viscera and six entrails. How am I different from anyone else? Although you are quite like other people, your cheeks are too small. Now the monkey had a funny face with its cheeks that caved inwards and a sharp chin. Sun Wukong felt it with his hand and replied with a laugh. Master, you didn't take everything into account. Although I'm a bit short of jaw, I've got more dewlap than other people to make up for it. Very well then, the patriarch said. 
which would you prefer to learn the 36 heavenly transformations or the 72 earthly ones your disciple wants to get as much out of it as he can so i'd like to learn the 72 earthly ones if that's what you want the patriarch replied come here and i'll teach you the spells thereupon he whispered into sun wakong's ear and who knows what miraculous spells he taught him the monkey king was the sort of person who understands everything once he is told a tiny part and he learned the spells on the spot he practiced and trained until he had mastered all 72 transformations one day the patriarch and all his disciples were in the sunset outside the three stars cave the patriarch asked sun wakong have you succeeded yet sun wakong replied thanks to your infinite mercy master your disciples results have been perfect and i can now rise on the clouds and fly <gasps> he's got his nimbus cloud or he could just fly like a bird let me see you try a flight the patriarch said Sun Wukong used his skill to perform a series of somersaults that carried him 50 or 60 feet into the air, then walked around on the clouds for about as long as it takes to eat a meal. Cloud Step He covered about a mile altogether before landing in front of the patriarch, folding his arms across his chest and saying, Master, that's flying and soaring in the clouds, the patriarch laughed. That's not soaring on the clouds. It's just climbing up them. There's an old saying that is that an immortal visits the northern sea in the morning and Chang Wu in the evening. But to take as long as you did just to go a mile doesn't count as climbing on the clouds. How can it be possible to visit the northern sea in the morning and Chang, Chang Wu in the evening? Sun Wukong asked. All cloud soars start off from the northern sea early in the morning. Visit the eastern, western, and southern seas, then come back to Chang Wu. Chang Wu is what the northern sea is called in the Lingling language. When you can go beyond all four seas in a single day, you can regard yourself as a cloud soarer. But that must be very difficult, Sun Wukong observed. Where there's a will, there's a way, the patriarch replied. Nothing but halves, master replied Sun Wukong with bows and katao, kowtows. I beg of you in your great mercy to teach me the art of cloud soaring. I promise that I will always be grateful. Immortals take off with a stamp of their feet, said the patriarch, but you do it differently. Just now I saw you pull yourself up as that is the way you do it. I'll show you how to do it in your own way and teach you the somersault cloud. Sun Wukong bowed again, imploring him to do so, and the patriarch taught him the spell. For this kind of cloud, the patriarch said, you make the magic by clasping your hands in the special way. Recite the words of the spell, clench your fist, shake yourself, and jump. With one somersault, you can go 60,000 miles. When the others heard this, they all ex exclaimed with a laugh. Lucky old Sun Wukong, with magic like this, he could be a messenger delivering official letters and reports, and he'd never go short of a meal. When it was dark, the patriarch and his pupils returned to the cave. That night, Sun Wukong moved his spirit, practiced the technique, and mastered the cloud somersault. From then on, he was free from all restraint, and he enjoyed the delights of immortality, drifting around as he pleased. <clears throat> on a day when spring was giving way to summer oh, I thought we lost the music again um, and all the students had been sitting under some pine trees listening to lectures for a long time they said Sun Wukong in what life did you earn your present destiny the other day our teacher whispered to you how to do the transformations to avoid the three disasters can you do all can you do them all yet it's true, brothers, said Sun Wukong with a grin. I can do them all. In the first place, it's because our master taught me. And in the second place, it's because I practiced them hard day and night. This would be a great time for you to give us a demonstration. At this suggestion, Sun Wukong braced his spirit to show off his skill. What's it to be, brothers? Tell me what you'd like to, me to turn myself into. 
Turn into a pine tree, they all said. Sun Wukong clenched his fist, said the magic words, shook himself, and changed into a pine tree. It was truly green and misty throughout the four seasons, raising its upright beauty to the clouds, not in the least like a demon monkey, every inch a tree that withstands frost and snow. When the students saw it, they clapped their hands and chuckled aloud, saying, Good old monkey, good old monkey. They did not realize that the row they were making had disturbed the patriarch, who rushed out through the door, dragging his stick behind him. Who's making a row out here? He asked. The students hurried, hurriedly pulled themselves together, straightened their clothes, and went over to him. Sun Wukong, who had now resumed his real appearance, said from the forest, Master, we were holding a discussion here, and there were no outsiders making a din. Yelling and shouting like that, the patriarch angrily roared, is no way for those cultivating their conduct to behave. If you are cultivating your conduct, the subtle vapors escape when you open your mouth, and when you wag your tongue, trouble starts. What was all the laughing and shouting about? Just now, Sun Wukong did transformation for fun. He told, We told him to turn himself into a pine tree, and he did. We all praised and applauded him, which was why we disturbed you with the noise, Master. We beg you to forgive us. The patriarch sent them all away, except for Sun Wukong, to whom he said, Come here. Is that a way to use your spirit? To change into a pine tree? Is this a skill you should be showing off in front of people? If you saw somebody else doing that, wouldn't you ask him to teach you? If other people see you doing it, they're bound to ask you to teach them. And if you want to keep out of trouble, you'll have to do so. Otherwise, they may do you harm, and then your life will be in danger. Sun Wukong katowed and said, Please forgive me, Master. I shan't punish you, the patriarch replied. But you'll have to go. Sun Wukong's eyes filled with tears. Master, where am I to go? Go back to where you came from, Sun Wukong had a sudden awakening, and he said, I came from the water curtain cave on the mountain of flowers and fruit in the country of Aeoli, in the eastern continent of Superior Body. If you hurry back there, the patriarch replied, you'll be able to preserve your life. If you stay here, it will be absolutely impossible to do so. Sun Wukong accepted his punishment. Yes, master, he said. I've been away from home for 20 years, and I do miss the old days and my children and grandchildren. But when I remember that I have not yet repaid your enormous generosity to me, I can't bring myself to go. We're not playing anything right now, right? <clears throat> what sort of kindness would you be doing me if you stayed? I'll be happy enough if you keep me out of any disasters you cause. Seeing that there was nothing else for it, Sun Wukong bowed and took leave of him, saying goodbye to all of the other students. Now that you're going, the patriarch said, I'm sure that your life will not be a good one. Whatever disasters you cause and crimes you commit, I forbid you under any cir circumstances to call yourself my disciple. If you so much as hint, at it, I'll know at once, and I'll tear off your monkey skin, chop up your bones, and banish your soul to the ninth darkness. I won't let you out for ten thousand eons. I promise never to give away a single letter of your name, said Sun Wukong. I'll just say that I taught myself. Sun Wukong took his leave and went away, making the spell of clasping his fist and jumped head over heels, summoned a somersault cloud, and went ba back to the eastern continent. Within two hours, he saw the water curtain cave on the mountain of flowers and fruit. The handsome monkey king was so pleased that he said to himself, When I left here, my mortal flesh and bones were heavy. But now I have the way, my body's light. No one in the world has real determination. To the firm will, the hidden becomes clear. When I last crossed the seas and went the waves got my way, but now on my return, the journey's easy. The parting words still echo in my ears. When will I see the Eastern Ocean again? Sun Wukong put away his cloud and headed straight to the mountain of flowers and fruit. As he followed the path there, he heard the call of the cranes and the cries of the apes. The crane calls 
echoed beyond the Milky Way, and the ape cries were pathetically sad. Sun Wukong shouted, Children, I'm back. Big monkeys and little monkeys came bounding in their thousands and tens of thousands from caves and the cliffs, from the grass and flowers, and down from the trees. They all crowded round the handsome monkey king, katowed and said, Your majesty, you're a cool one. How could you stay away for so long, abandoning us all here? We've been desperate for you to come back. A demon has been mistreating us terribly. He's occupied our water curtain cave, and we've been fighting for our lives with him. Recently, he's been stealing our things and carrying off many of our youngsters. We've had to stay awake all night to guard our families. Thank goodness you've come back. Another year without you, your majesty, and every one of us would be under his control, cave and all. Sun Wukong was furious. Who is this demon? <clears throat> What an outrage. Tell me everything about him and then I'll go and give him what's coming to him. The monkey host katowed again and said, Your Majesty, the wretch calls himself the Demon King of the of Confusion. He lives north of here. How far away is his lair? Sun Wukong asked. He comes and goes in cloud and mist with wind and rain or thunder and lightning. So we don't know how far it is. If that's how it is, Sun Wukong replied, then don't worry. Just keep yourselves amused while I go and find him. The splendid monkey king jumped up into the air, and as he somersaulted towards the north, he saw a high and precipitous mountain. It was a fine sight. Perpendicular peaks jutting straight up. Deep sunk wi winding streams. The perpendicular peaks jutting straight up pierced the sky. The deep sunk winding streams led to the underworld. On pairs of cliffs, the plants compete in strangeness. Elsewhere, pine vies in greenness with bamboo. To the left are docile dragons. To the right are tame tigers. Iron oxen plowing are a common sight. Golden coins are always sow as seeds. Hidden birds sing beautifully. Red phoenixes stand in the sun, racing over stones the clear waves, twist and bend in a vicious torrent. Many are the famous mountains in the world, and many the flowers that bloom and wither on them. But this scenery is eternal, unchanging through the four seasons. It is truly the mountain from which the three words, worlds spring. The cave in the belly of the water that nourishes the five elements. As the handsome monkey king stood gazing in silence at this view, he heard voices. When he went down the mountainside to look, he found the cave in the belly of the water facing the cliff. Several minor demons were dancing around in front of the cave doors, and they ran, ran away as soon as they saw Sun Wukong. Wait a moment, Sun Wukong said. I want you to take a message for me. I am the king of the water curtain cave in the mountain of flowers and fruit that lies due south of here. I've come to find that demon of confusion of yours, or whatever he's called. The one who's been mistreating my children and grandchildren and have it out with him. The minor demons scuttled into the caves and reported, A disaster, your majesty. What do you mean, disaster? the demon king asked. There's a monkey outside the cave, the minor demons reported. He tells that he's the king of the water curtain cave on the mountain of flowers and fruit. He says that you have been bullying his children and grandchildren and that he's come specially to find you to have it out with you. The demon king laughed. <clears throat> Those monkey devils are always going on about a king of theirs who renounced the world to cultivate his conduct. I suppose it must be him who's here now. Did you see how he was dressed or what weapons he was carrying? He hasn't got any weapons. He's barehanded, and he's wearing a red gown belted with a yellow silk sash and a pair of black boots. He's, he isn't dressed like a monk or a layman or an immortal. He's barehanded and empty-fisted, and he's standing outside the doors yelling. Bring me my armor and weapons, said the demon king when he heard this. The minor demons produced them at once, and when he had donned his armor, he went out of the door with all the demons, his sword in hand. 
in his hand. Who is the king of the water curtain cave? He roared. Sun Wukong took a quick look at him and saw that. On his head, he wore a dark golden helmet, glistening in the sun. On his body, he wore a black silk gown, flapping in the breeze. Below, he, he wore black metal armor, girt with a leather belt. And his feet, he wore patterned boots, as splendid as a field marshal's. His waist was 10 feet round, and his height was 30 cubits. In his hand, he held a sword with gleaming point and edge. He called himself the Demon King of Confusion, and his appearance was truly dazzling. You insolent demon, shouted the Monkey King. Your eyes may be big, but you can't see who I am. The Demon King laughed at him. You don't even stand four feet from the ground. You're still in your 20s, and you've got no weapon in your hand. What sort of mad courage makes you challenge me to a fight? insolent demon retorted Sun Wukong. How blind you are. You may think I'm small, but I can grow easily enough. You may think I'm unarmed, but I could pull the moon down from the sky with my two hands. Don't worry, old Sun Wukong will, shock, will sock you one. Sun Wukong gave a jump and leapt into the air, taking a swing at his face. The demon king put out his hand to stop him and said, Look how big I am, you dwarf. If you use your fists, I'll use my sword, but I'll only make myself look ridiculous if I killed you with a sword. Wait till I put my sword down and then I'll give you a display of boxing. Well said, exclaimed Sun Wukong, spoken like a man. Come on then. The Demon King dropped his guard to throw a punch and Sun Wukong rushed in towards him, punching and kicking. When he spread out his hand, it was enormous and when he clenched his fist, it was pretty hard. Sun Wukong hit the Demon King in the ribs, kicked his backside, and smashed several of his joints. The Demon King seized his steel sword that was as big as a plank and swung it at Sun Wukong's skull. Sun Wukong dodged the blow, and the sword only split air. Seeing how ugly the Demon King had turned, Sun Wukong used his magic art of getting extra bodies. He pulled out one of his hairs. <gasps> Pluck of many! popped it in his mouth, chewed it up, and blew it out into the air, shouting, Change! It turned into two or three hundred little monkeys who all crowded around him. Oh, shit. He can summon way more. <laughs> Sun Wukong now had an immortal body, and there was no magic transformation of which he was not capable. Since he had followed the way, he could change each of the 84,000 hairs on his body into anything he wanted. The little monkeys were too quick and nimble for sword or spear. Looking at them, leaping to forwards and jumping backwards, rushing up and surrounding the demon king, grabbing him, seizing him, poking him in the backside, pulling at his feet, punching him, kicking him, tearing his hair out, scratching at his eyes, twisting his nose, all picking him up together and throwing him to the ground. They went on, went on until they had beaten him to a pulp. Sun Wukong snatched his sword from him, told the little monkeys to get out of the way, and brought it down on the crown of his head, splitting it, it in two. Splitting it into two. Then he led his forces charging into the cave where they exterminated all the demons, big and small. He shook his hair and put it back on his body. The monkeys who did not go back on his body were the little monkeys the Demon King had carried off from the water curtain cave. Sun Wukong asked them how they had got there. There were 30 or 40 of them, and they replied with tears in their eyes. It was after your majesty went off to become an immortal. He, was, he has been fighting with us for the last two years. He brought us all here by force. All the things here, the stone bowls and plates, were stolen from our cave by that beast. If it's our stuff, take it all out, said Sun Wukong. He then set free fire to the cave in the belly of the water and burnt it to a cinder. Come back with me, he ordered the monkeys. Your majesty, they replied. When we came here, all we could hear was the wind howling in our ears as it blew us here. So we don't know the way. How are we ever going to get back? <clears throat> There's nothing to it at all. 
Wait. There's nothing at all to the, that spell he used, said Sun Wukong. I can do it too, as now I only have to know the smallest bit about something to understand it completely. Shut your eyes and don't worry. Splendid Monkey King, he recited a spell, took them riding on a hurricane, then brought the cloud down to the ground. Open your eyes and look, children, he shouted as soon as the monkey's feet touched the ground. They recognized their home. In their delight, they all ran along the familiar path to the cave, and the monkeys who had stayed in the cave all crowded in as well. They divided themselves into age groups and bowed in homage to the monkey king. Wine and food was laid out to celebrate, and they asked, how, asked him how he had defeated the demon king and saved their children. When Sun Wukong had told them the whole story, the monkeys were full of admiration. Where did you learn such arts, your majesty? They asked insistently. When I left you, Sun Wukong replied, I followed the waves and the currents and drifted across the eastern ocean to the southern Jambu continent. Here I taught myself to take human form and to wear the, these clothes and boots. I swaggered around for eight or nine years, but I never found the way. So I sailed across the western ocean to the western continent of Cattle Gift. After long inquiries, I was lucky enough to meet a venerable immortal who taught me the true result, which makes me as immortal as heaven and the great Dharma gate to eternal youth. The monkeys all congratulated him and exclaimed that his like could not be found in a billion years. Sun Wukong laughed and said, Children, we should congratulate ourselves on having a surname. What is your majesty's surname? The monkey masses asked. My surname is now Sun, and my Buddhist name is Wukong. The monkeys all clapped their hands with joy and said, Your majesty is old Sun, and we are second Sun, third Sun, thin Sun, little Sun, a family of sons. A nation of sons, a den of sons, all offered old son their respects with big plates and big and small bowls of coconut toddy, grape wine, magic flowers, and magic fruit. The whole household was happy. My word. By uniting themselves with a single surname, they are waiting to be transferred to the register of immortals. If you don't know how this ended, and want to know about the rest of their lives there, then listen to the explanation in the next installment. Chapter three. That might be a good jumping off point though. Two chapters down of a hundred. <laughs> Dang, how do people read audible books, man? How long does it take to record? Um, okay, yeah. So that's it for chapters one and two of Journey to the West. I think the first 10 or 12 chapters are all based on Sun Wukong. Uh, and then I think the monk joins this crew on the screen right now. Uh, but anyways, that is going to be it for tonight. I'll be on again tomorrow morning. We'll be starting chapter two in the game, Black Myth Wukong. And then there'll be a short stream, so I'm not too sure if we'll have more reading. I might just jump on deuces, homies. I uh, might start reading. I might, might do like a late stream after work to do some reading. So like be like 9 30 ish no it'll be like 10 o'clock ish maybe just do an hour but i'll be sure to try to record all of them and post them on youtube but anyways thanks for watching you guys rock mean it bye bye